Ready? All right. I want to welcome you to our Sunday morning services. And uh, even though we can't be gathered together, isn't technology a wonderful thing during a time like this? And I do want you to know that uh, I uh, consider our flock very precious. And I pray that you are enjoying your time together as family. And pray that you will continue to comply by all that uh, our state and federal government is recommending that we do, that we uh, continue to do what needs to be done, and prayerfully, uh, we'll be gathered back together here uh, within a week or two, but it's good to know that you're tuning in, and for those that weren't able to tune in by internet this morning, uh, we have taken copies to them. Uh, Brother Jim was uh, gracious enough to make us some copies. We got those copies out to some of our elderly folks, and they are watching it on DVD. So we're grateful for the technology. We're grateful for Brother Jim being willing to come in and, and pre-record this for us and get it uploaded to the Internet and to get some copies out to our folks. Uh, I do want to remind you that uh, even though we missed last Sunday, we've missed this Sunday, uh, gathering together as God's family here at Fellowship Baptist, that uh, if you would want to send your tithes and offerings in, that you can send them to the church address here. That's 481 Cornishfield Street, Harrodsburg, Kentucky. And uh, just send those in if you'd like. And may the Lord continue to bless you. Uh, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer and ask God to bless our time together today. Our Heavenly Father, as we approach your throne today, we just want to thank you and praise you, God. Father, we want to thank you in all things. Father, you tell us to be careful for nothing but by prayer and supplication to make a request known unto you that the peace of God which passeth all understanding, shall guard our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. So, Father, we ask you right now to bless our time together. Father, be it those precious folks that are out there listening in. Father, we pray for all those that are out there that have uh, come in contact with the virus. We pray for your healing hand upon them. We pray you'd be at the doctors and the nurses and the health care takers. Lord, we pray that you'd be with those uh, around them, Lord, uh, be at the families, Lord, as we uh, do what you would have us to do. May we, uh, under your guidance and under your leadership, uh, do all that's necessary that, Lord, we would turn to you and, Lord, uh, cry out to you. And, Father, know that you will hear from us as we will hear from you by our cries. And, Lord, we love you and thank you today. I ask you to be with all those, those that are in nursing homes and hospitals, those that are abroad, Lord, that are sick. Uh, we pray for each and every church family. We pray for the church as a whole today. We pray for our government today, Lord. Father, I know they're carrying uh, a heavy burden as they're trying to do what they need to do, Lord, for the good of the country. We pray your blessings upon them. We pray that they are pursuing your counsel, that they are seeking your wisdom, God. That, Father, you will guide their hearts and help them, Lord, in knowing what's best for the good of all. And, Lord, we just thank you and love you most of all for your sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. We thank you for the shed blood, Lord, that we could have eternal life with you by asking forgiveness of sin and inviting you to be Lord of our lives. Father, we love you and praise you now. Ask that this time be dedicated to you, that it be to allow you to minister to our hearts, to refresh in our minds, to uh, make us aware, Lord, that you're still sovereign, that you're in full control that your plan is continually being unfolded. And so, Father, there's nothing to be fearful of. Father, I know that many times we uh, often let things of this nature, uh, let fear play a factor within our lives. But may we, by the grace of God, look to you for all of our needs and for, Lord, the cure that we have. We know that you have it. And so, Father, we commend it into your hands and pray your will be done. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to welcome you this morning to our service, and if you're tuning in out there and you're not a member of Fellowship Baptist Church, we do want to welcome you and pray that you will come and join us. That If you don't have a church home, that you might pray about asking the Lord if this might be where he would have you to come to. So we do know that scripture verse of the week, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication 
with thanksgiving, present your request to God. That comes from Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. We want to pray for Kirkwood Baptist Church this week. Uh, of course, there won't be any choir practice today or any church activities this week. We will not be having Wednesday night services uh, this coming up week. Uh, the deacons and I will meet uh, sometime this week, and we will get you word as to what we will be doing as far as next Sunday, and I'm sure that will be according to the way things play out with what's going on. But again, uh, take this time that you have and spend time with God. Get into the Word of God. Spend time with Him. Spend time with your families. Take advantage of this precious time. We can thank God for the privilege of what we have time to do, and we'll talk about that a little more in our morning message this morning. But don't forget our Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Ministry. Uh, they are collecting things, uh, bar soap, washcloths, combs, brushes, toothbrushes, no toothpaste, please. Bring these items in and give them to Sister Judy Smock, and they deeply appreciate your willingness to volunteer in that work, that ministry, and for all those that support that ministry, we're thankful. Don't forget our Annie Armstrong Easter offering received through March. My friends, listen. We want to continue to support our missionaries, so continue to send your tithes and offerings. It's important that we continue the work of Christ. We want to do that. We want to be faithful here at Fellowship Baptist Church about continuing the ministries that we are involved in here at Fellowship Baptist. The church voted to begin a new digital sign fund. Uh, pray about that. That might be something that you might want to put on the back burner for the time being, but do keep it in prayer. Our open prayer time on Tuesday mornings, do not forget that. Uh, this past Tuesday morning, we had seven to show up. Praise be to the Lord. It was a wonderful time in the conference room as we prayed and, and sought the Lord and lifted up our supplications and our prayer requests. So you come and join us on Tuesday mornings if you have the time to do so. Our ongoing ministries, don't forget those. Bags of Hope Food Pantry, Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Ministry, and Box Tops for Education. Again, we want to welcome you to the service this morning and pray God's blessings upon you. Uh, my voice is not the greatest. I am not a singer, but I did feel that I might try to sing Amazing Grace for you this morning because God's grace is amazing, is it not? God's grace is amazing. So bear with me uh, as I, again, am not a singer, but I do try to uh, sing for the glory of the Lord. So, <clears throat> amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed through many dangers tolls and snares I have already come tis grace hath brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home the Lord has promised good to me his word my hope 
secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. When we been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the stars, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. And amen. God's grace is amazing. This morning, if you want to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians, I'm going to be reading from 1 Thessalonians. I'll give you time to, I hope you have your Bibles with you. And just as we uh, read together here in the sanctuary, uh, you get your Bibles out. And even being there at home, uh, once you find your place there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, if you would, out of the reverence to the holy and almighty Word of God, uh, stand in reverence to the Word of God. Chapter 5 in 1 Thessalonians, begin with verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of the dark. Therefore, let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also ye do. Let's have a word of prayer, and ask God's blessings on our reading of the word. Our Heavenly Father, once again, as we have broken the bread of life, we gather at your table. And we want to ask right now, Father, that you would forgive us for we fail you. Father, may you forgive me. I pray you'd cleanse my mind, my heart, my very being, my soul, Lord, to the very depths, Lord, by the precious, precious blood of Jesus Christ. God, I pray today that you'd hide me and use me as your mouthpiece. I pray that today I'd just be used for your glory, hidden behind the cross at Calvary. May Jesus Christ be exalted in this place today. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be able to gather together, even though it might be through technology and others might be in other places. But Lord, we thank you for allowing us to gather together as your children, as a family of God at Fellowship Baptist Church. Father, I just pray now your anointing upon this word. I pray you'd refresh in our hearts and our minds. I pray that you'd speak to us today from the very spirit and truth of God. Father, in all that you do here today, we'll be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're reading from the book of Thessalonians, and of course, Paul being the great apostle that he was, the man of God that he was, the man that loved the Lord the way he did, was always throughout his life after his uh, experience there on the Damascus Road, had such a heart and compassion thereafter coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ 
and having his eyes open to the spirit of truth from God's word, God himself, there on the street called Straight in Damascus in modern-day Syria. Paul became a different man. Paul became a man that loved Christ. Paul became a man that was determined with all of his heart, mind, and soul to preach the word of God, to share the gospel good news of Jesus Christ, the love and forgiveness of God to all people. And he done that to the church at Thessalonica. He done that on his second missionary journey. He begins his letter by thanking God for their strong faith. He begins by thanking God for their good reputation. He thanks God because they were willing to accept the truth when he went there and understood what God was sharing with them about his love. He makes a request to this church, to this flock of people. He says to them, I request by you that you live your lives daily pleasing to God. He reminds them of the hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. He recommends that by them that they be prepared at all times. Scholars, pastors, and you know about everybody today has their own opinion, their own theory as to when Christ might return. But Paul's final instruction to the church here was not how Christ was going to come back. And it was not when Christ was going to return, but that he would return unexpectedly. He says here in verse 2 that he's going to return like a thief in the night. And so Paul focuses on what the church should be doing with the time that we have left. What the church should be doing with the time that we have left. I wonder what you're really doing in these days. I know that oftentimes things of what we're experiencing can set fear uh, within our minds and our hearts, and it can cause us to think about everything but the right thing. But I pray that during this time, my friends, dear flock, congregation, I pray that during this time you will set your mind on Christ. I pray that you will share the Word of God the way that you are capable of doing. Maybe it be by phone, maybe it be by Facebook, Maybe it be by uh, uh, internet, whatever method you have. Maybe it be by letter, whatever way. But you pray, pursue the Lord. Ask God to forgive us as a country of sinners that we've been. Ask God to forgive you and you be that person that the Apostle Paul was in sharing with these precious people. But Paul focuses on what the church should be doing with the time we have left. What should we be doing as a church with the time we have left. Well, a couple of weeks ago, or maybe three now, I'm not quite sure about the time, but I know that Denise and I was driving up to Florence, Kentucky with some friends. We were driving up to Florence, Kentucky because I had been texting a gentleman at a car lot up there. The gentleman's name was Eric, and I had been texting him about a couple of used cars that we were going to come up and look at. And as we were on her way, I told my wife, I said, you know, it's been about three weeks. I've been texting him about this car and that car. And I said, you know, long story short, I called him and, and talked to him about this one. He didn't have that one. And I said, well, I said, we're off this weekend. We'd like to come up and look at one. I said, but I don't want to waste your time, and I don't want you to waste my time. And I said, down here, we've been around several car lots, and they're not willing to come off of their price more than $500 or the most at 1000 I said, if you're not willing to move more than that, I said, don't waste our time. And so he said to me on the phone, he said, I'll tell you what you do. You bring your precious wife up here, and he said, you will see that she will drive home in a new car. And I sort of chuckled, and I said, well, I'm sure she would for the right price. I said, but I'm trying to tell you. He said, no, he said, you bring your wife and he said, I promise you, he said, we'll give you the deal that she'll take home a car. And so, lo and behold, we made the trip up there. And when we got there, we pulled up on the parking lot, and it's the Jeff Wilder uh, uh, Honda dealer. And we pulled up, and I was going to ask for Eric. Well, this fellow came out, and he said, my name is Scott. And he said, Eric is busy. And so... Uh, eventually, here in a few minutes, Eric come out and he said, I just want you all to know that, uh, introduced himself, and he said, now, 
I want you all to know that Scott, my brother here, and, and by the way, I do want to make mention of this. Uh, it's not a racial comment, but Eric is a black gentleman, and Scott is a white gentleman, and Eric said, this is my brother. And I realized a little bit later, and it didn't take long for me to realize why he said he was his brother. He was his brother in Christ. These two men are two of the most godliest men that you could ever want to meet. But long story short, uh, Scott began to uh, reveal to us of what he had on the lot. He said, I'll go get this one, pull it around. We'll take it for a test drive. So we take off down the road uh, for a test drive, and, and I'm driving, and Scott's in the back riding, and he is explaining <coughs> excuse me, the features of the vehicle to me. <coughs> Excuse me. And not long down the road, one thing led to another, and it was revealed to him that I was a pastor. He said, oh, he said, my favorite verse of the Bible is Galatians 2.20. And he quoted that off, and he quoted a couple more passages along with it. And long story short, we got to talking about spiritual things, and I could just feel the spirit moving. It was just unbelievable. Anyway, we got back, and on the way back to the car lot, we literally forgot all about what was going on with the car. And he said, I've got something that I heard that might give you a good message uh, idea. He said, I know you pastors are always looking for a message idea. I said, I sure am. He said, well, here's a good one. <clears throat> he said, the title of your message needs to be Objects appear closer in the mirror than they are. I want you to think about that for just a moment. Objects appear closer in the mirror than they are. And so I thought, now what can I do to illustrate that title for a sermon? And so I got on the internet and I found something and I found a, a, a clip of a, a video uh, of oblivious Sean, I don't know if you've seen this uh, movie or not, but it's called Oblivious Sean. Uh, Sean is in his house, and he's sitting watching TV one day. And, and Sean decides that he's going to get up, and he's going to go to the market, and he's going to get himself a Coca-Cola and a bar of ice cream. So he gets up out of his living room. He opens the door, walks out on the sidewalk, goes through the yard gate, and he's going through the yard gate. There's someone coming up the street, which he pays no mind to at all. <clears throat> Excuse me. He crosses the street, goes around the block, crosses the next street. As he's crossing the street, there's a car. There's an automobile sitting there with a hole in the windshield about the size of a basketball, which he passes and pays no attention to and doesn't notice at all. He walks down the street. He goes into the uh, marketplace there and He's walking back to the drink cooler, and as he's walking back to the drink cooler, which is on his right, he's got his eyes on the candy aisle on the left. And he goes back, and he reaches to open the door, and he opens the door without seeing or without noticing. On the door are two handprints of blood. And he turns around, walks back up front to the counter, and in the distance sees a shadow, lays his money on the counter, and just blurts out the words, I've left the money on the counter. And he walks back out of the store, going up the street. And he's, he comes out of the store to go up the street. There are several people coming up the street, which he, again, pays no attention to whatsoever. He goes back up the street, crosses the street. And along the way, uh, there are like three or four dead people, uh, one in an alley, one laying on the side of the other side of the sidewalk, and he crosses back across the street, going to his house, nearly bumps into literally a gentleman and uh, that has ball and chain on. He enters his yard gate, walks back up his sidewalk, goes into the house, through the door, sits on his sofa, and sits in front of his television. And I'll tell you that to say this, that he does this in this movie called Oblivious Sean, not realizing that he was in a uh, in the midst of a zombie infestation. 
I mean, he had no clue whatsoever. And I share that with you to tell you today, I think that there are a lot of people, and I share this humbly with you, I think there are a lot of people that have no clue as to what's going on today in our world. I think there's a lot of people that have no understanding as to what's happening in our world. And I'm not trying to predict in any way when Christ is going to return. All I can tell you is this. I know that he's going to return. I can tell you this as a congregation. I, as Paul shared with the Thessalonica church, I pray that you are prepared. I pray that you're ready. And so the question is, is if Christ were to return tomorrow, would he find a relationship of peace? If Christ will return tomorrow, would he find a relationship of peace? Will we have peace and be at rest in the Lord? Would we be at peace and rest with one another? Or would he find corrupt corruption with conflict? And what I'm seeing across our world today is so much, even among so-called Christians, corruption with conflict, such bitterness and such hatred, that is not of the Spirit of God. First John tells us we're to love one another. The Lord Jesus Christ and the, all the law and all the scriptures hang on these two verses, I believe, that Christ shared with his disciples. That we are to love the Lord thy God with all of our heart, soul, and might. All of our strength and to love our neighbor as ourself. We're to have the love of Christ within our hearts and to see such hatred and such bitterness. Uh, I wonder, could that possibly come from the Lord? But if the Lord were to return tomorrow, how would he find our relationships? Would we be at peace with him, with one another? If the Lord were returned to tomorrow, would he find us responsible with the opportunities that we have? My friends, listen. We might even in the next day or two, according to what's going on with this virus, get put on lockdown in our own homes and across this country. But my friends, we have an opportunity before us. We have an opportunity and we have a responsibility as being God's children that we can still do things for the cause and the glory of God. We have an opportunity because of all this bitterness and all this conflict that's going on throughout our country. We have the opportunity to get on our knees, to get on our faces. I was reading just this morning from the book of Numbers as I've been reading about the life of Moses and how that Moses fell on his face. Moses and Aaron so often fell on their faces for their congregations, for the people of the nation. They fell on their faces even though the people were so rebellious and so wicked-minded and so hard-hearted. They continually fell on their faces before God. They intervened with the Spirit of God. They were a mediator and God answered Moses' prayer. He answered Aaron's prayer for the sake of those people that were without understanding. He answered their prayers for those that were so blind. We have an opportunity. Take time and use that opportunity for the glory of God to reach out to these people that are in need. If Jesus were to return tomorrow, how would he find our relationships? How would he find us responsible with the opportunities we have? How or would he find us regretting that we needed to repent of something? Oh, my friends, listen. There's still the opportunity until the Lord returns, and no one knows when that is except the Father himself. But we still have the opportunity. You still have the opportunity to repent. You still have the opportunity to say to the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask you on behalf of the blood that you shed on the cross of Calvary to forgive me of my sins. I invite you, Lord, to come into my heart and my life. I ask you, Lord, to be Lord of my life. We have an opportunity. We have an opportunity. 
let it not be that we will be found regretting that we needed to repent of something. Let it not be found that we would not uh, that we would be regretting not being in a relationship that we ought to be with God. Let it not be found upon the Lord's return that we not be in the right relationship with a brother or sister. Let it not be found that we not be in the right relationship with anyone because we are children of God. He says to us that we are children of light in verse 5. We are children of the day. We are not of the night. We are not of the dark. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, let us, the children of God, that's been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, let us, he says, who are the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. So my friends, listen. If Jesus were to return tomorrow, would he find your relationships at peace? Or would he find you with corruption and conflict? Would he find you responsible with the opportunities that you have before you today? Would he find you regretting that you needed to repent of some sin? Would he find you regretting that you didn't cry out to him? I know that in Matthew, the Bible says in the end times, when this thing is all over, when it's all said and done, when the rapture of the church has been taken, when the Holy Spirit leaves this place, that there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And he's not talking about so much, my friends, the word study there is not talking about the, the weeping and gnashing of teeth because of all the devastation and the chaos and, and under, under uh, the, the divisions that are going on. He's talking about there the regretting of not surrendering to the God that loved you, that died for you, that's willing to spare you and save you and deliver you from all of this chaos that's coming. It's coming, friends. It's coming. I promise you, it's coming by the word of God. It's coming. So let us be found in a right relationship with God, in a right relationship with one another. Let us be found being responsible children of God of the day with the opportunities that we have. Let us be found not regretting that we haven't repented of all things before the Lord and be at peace and rest with Jesus Christ. In other words, if Jesus were to come tomorrow, let us be found ready. Let us be found ready. Objects in the mirror are much closer than they appear. I know before we got backup cameras on our vehicles. I know before we got beepers in our vehicles and on larger trucks that we used to get in our vehicles and use our rear view mirror and our side mirrors to back up and sometimes maybe didn't use them or didn't see things behind us. And before we know it, or even if we saw it through the mirror, it looked to be farther away than it was. And I know by experience, I backed into several things myself. The object in the mirror is much closer than it appears. My friends, our Lord's return is much closer than it appears. I tell you that based on what the Word of God says about the things that are going to happen, and He tells us that we are children of day, not of night. We are aware of these things by the Spirit of truth that lives in us that God reveals to us as His children. As Eric, my friend there at the car lot, gave me the title for the sermon, Objects in the Mirror Are Much Closer Than They Appear. He said, I'll give you a statement for the end of your message. Pastor Lynn. He said the statement for the end of your message as scripture tells us that Christ sits on the throne of grace and he sits at the right hand of the Father he looks at me and he says where do you suppose Jesus is today? And I knew with that question I needed to put my mind to work. 
And I said, well, I know the Bible says that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father on the throne of grace. He is making intercession for you and I. He is our lawyer above all lawyers. He is our best friends. He best friend. He is our advocate in all things because he loves us with such compassion being his children. And I began to think and I said, well, I said, the Bible says he's sitting on the throne of grace at the right hand of the Father. He says, I know that. He says, but as the Bible speaks to us about the Lord's return and we seeing things being fulfilled as they are, he says, I wonder. Now, he's not saying that he is. He's just saying, I wonder if Jesus might not be standing today. Be standing at the door. Be standing at the door with his hand upon the knob. Looking at the Father. Saying, can I go get my children? Could it be that close, friends? Sure it could. Sure it could. I mean, just imagine that. Jesus standing at the door with his hand on the knob, looking at the Father because of the fulfillment of prophecy, because of the fulfillment of God's word. And he says, can I go get my children? He's coming after you if you're bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. But my friends, when he comes, remember, remember, don't be found in a unpeaceful, unrestful relationship. Don't be found in an irresponsible time with the opportunities that you've had. Don't be found regretting that you should have got something right that's wrong and you know it. Don't be found regretting that you could have asked Jesus Christ to save you by the blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary and you just wouldn't do it. That's why he died. He died to show you he loved you. He died to share the gift of God's heart with you. He died to deliver you, and you and I can be delivered under the blood of Christ. And when he comes, we're going with him as God's children. So Paul, again, he makes his request to these faithful followers. He says, live your lives daily pleasing to God. He reminds them of the hope of the resurrection because it is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we have life. And our hope is in that life of the resurrection of our Lord. He recommends to them that they be prepared at all times. In other words, he says to them, out of the love that I've shared with you, by the love of God, he says, just keep your hearts ready. Just be ready. Take advantage of the opportunities that you have. And don't let time be wasted as we see the day approaching of the Lord. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you again today. God, we thank you for your word. And Father, we know we've heard uh, all of our lives. For ages, Lord, we've heard about the return of the Lord. Father, without a doubt, you're coming back. Your son is going to return. And it's not that important as to how he's going to return as much as when he's going to return as it is in being prepared for his return. Oh God, I pray for those that are watching today. I pray for those that are listening today. I pray that if they've not gotten their hearts right, if they've never confessed their sins, I pray today will be the day that they just cry out to the Lord. Just ask Jesus to forgive them of their sins, knowing that he died for their sins on the cross of Calvary and shed his precious blood that they could have eternal life by inviting Jesus to be their Lord. That Father, the Bible tells us that the Spirit of God, the indwelling Spirit of God will come in at that very moment and begin to reveal Himself to them by the Spirit of truth. God, I pray this today. God, I pray for our flock today. Let them know that I miss them. Let them know that I love them. Denise and I love them dearly, Lord. God, watch over them. I pray today your Heavenly protection upon each of them, Lord, upon their families. God, keep them protected of this virus 
and all of the evil that is out there. I thank you today, sweet Holy Spirit of God, for the reins that you continue to hold upon the evil that's out there. Knowing that one day, Lord, when you return, the sweet Holy Spirit of God is going to leave with your beloved children. And then people won't believe the chaos that they'll experience. And I hope that it won't be too late for those that are listening today because they have not the right relationship with you because they have been responsible with the opportunities that they have because they have no regrets in confessing all they need to confess before you and getting all they need to get right with those around them and just being ready for your return. Father, we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for what you do. Until we meet again, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ and by the blood of the cross, we ask in Christ's name, amen.